Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm honored to be here. And uh, I must thank uh, the Global Women's Strike and Payday Men's Network for making this possible. Um, let me start by trying to recall that period in 1967 when, when my father launched, uh, or launched the Arusha Declaration. Uh, when he launched the declaration, it was, uh, it was a period when it was spontaneous. Uh, the, the moment he, this, the declaration was, was uh, announced on radio, uh, there were spontaneous uh, uh, manifestations of marches, let's say, marches and demonstrations in support of the declaration. And the reason that uh, I believe this was spontaneous is because uh, the Arusha Declaration spoke for the ordinary people. And so that was why you, you, you saw this, uh, this spontaneous uh, uh, support for, for the Declaration. Now, this went on for, for a while until he decided that uh, since everyone was supporting him, then he had also to, to, to show, to return that support. So he also participated in one of the marches and walked uh, some distance from the village where he was born to Mwanza, which is some, some 200 kilometers. And uh, people tell me it's, uh, it took eight days. I don't know, I was too young, but it, it took eight days. Anyway, I, I will speak today basically, as, as I'm saying, I, I was seven years old when the, uh, uh, the Arusha Declaration was, was uh, announced. So I would speak really from, from the experience that I have growing up in, in uh, that family. And, and in, in this way, I think uh, perhaps I, I, I would be able to give um, an indication of what type of person he was from that per perspective. We, as, a, as, as, uh, as his children, were really kept out of his work. We were not encouraged to, to go into politics, although in later years, uh, some of my brothers and sisters, when they were adults, they decided to go into politics, but we were not uh, encouraged to, to go into his work, and uh, we were not really taken to any of his events. This, he, he, he made sure that his work, uh, that his family uh, did not go into politics. But I, I have to say that later, in later years, he did, he did not discourage them, but in the early years, he, he did not want uh, his family to be involved in, in politics. Now, I'd like to speak of, uh, of, of the experience of, of, of us as, as his children in realizing who was this person we were living in, with. And I'd like to give the example of my sister who uh, told me that when she went to school, in the very early years of school, one of her friends, um, who I'd like to add is, is also the younger sister of the Deputy High Commissioner from, from the Tanzania High Commission. <laughs> so, so this friend, in the very, they were still very young, said, do you know? You know your father is a king? And my, my sister said, no, she's not a king. She's, she, uh, he's not a king. He's a president. And they argued for a long time. And, and my sister was confused, so, so she went home and asked him, are you a king? And he said, no, I'm just a president, I'm, I'm not a king. <laughs> so anyway, at least she had, she had a good grasp. My sister had a good grasp of, 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 of who, who, um, who her father was. Uh, I'd like to talk also about our education. We attended the same schools as, as other Tanzanian, Tanzanians attended. It's true that during that period, the education, uh, the standard of education was much better than it is right now. And so you can say that we, we, uh, we were able to get a good education. Um, however, I, my belief is that even for a socialist president, you would have expected that that person would have tried to send his children 
to something which is uh, not to the same schools that, that the people attended. So, so I would, uh, I'm saying these things out of conviction, not because, not because he's my father, but I'm just saying this, this because I think if it was someone else, and, and we have instances of people who, who felt that the, only, the, the education system that they had in, in their countries was not good enough for, their, for the members of their family, for their children, and they sent their children outside, uh, outside these countries to, to get uh, what they considered a better education. Mm -hmm. But he did not. Uh, and then, uh, so we went through the same, as I was saying, we went through the same system of education that everyone else attended. I had an opportunity um, after my A-levels to travel to Italy for studies. But even when I went to Italy, it was not because he uh, did anything to, to, to enable me to go there. It was one of, one of my cousins, actually, who arranged for me to go to study in a college uh, because he had some friends there in Italy. And I thank him for that because now I can speak Italian also, <laughs> in addition to Swahili. <laughs> Anyway, after I completed that course in, in, uh, in Milan, I began, uh, I didn't want to go back to Tanzania immediately. So I began to go around uh, to various places uh, in, in Italy to find the possibility of getting a scholarship so that I could continue with my studies. And it went, it went on for quite some time. And I, everywhere I went, I wasn't, I, I wasn't uh, successful. But I know, uh, I remember there was one uh, individual who was working in the Tanzanian High Commission in Rome, and he knew the trouble I, I went through trying to get a scholarship. And he said, he commented, he, he commented to some uh, a Tanzanian who was visiting Rome at that time. He said, this, you, Tanzania has to be one of the strangest countries in the world, because I cannot imagine the son of a president, going around, just not being able to, to get a scholarship. So, so this, is, <laughs> this is my experience of, of having a father as a president. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, let, me, let me explain a bit about the Tanzanian education system. At that time, if you wanted a government scholarship, you would have to go through that system. Now, when I went to Italy, I had, uh, actually I had, um, I had to cut my studies before completing my A, a, schools, uh, a level, sorry. I, I, I decided, um, everybody is so eager to, to travel at that age, to travel outside Tanzania. So I, I had a few months uh, to complete my studies and I decided, no, maybe I, I should better, I, it's better that I go to Italy. And so I, I removed myself from the system which would have enabled me to get a government scholarship. So it was very difficult for me to, to get the scholarship. And I knew, I, I knew my father well enough to, to know that it was more difficult for me than anyone else to, to get that scholarship. So this is why I, I knew I, I could never have got that scholarship. It was next to impossible, actually. <laughs> now, that, that person who, who heard this story happened to have some friends in Canada. And so, uh, since he was a former uh, government official, and he had some, I think he had some sympathy for, for my father and, and me, I believe. <laughs> he talked to his friends in Canada, and I was able to uh, get a scholarship uh, through some a missionary, actually a missionary organization. And I, I went to Canada between 1981 and uh, 1984. So... That's part of my story. Anyway, I'm, I'm still continuing. <laughs> my, my other uh, siblings had, had similar experiences. I, I have a brother uh, whose name is Makongoro. He uh, served in the Tanzanian army, which went into Uganda. Although, although he went there after, um, after the fighting had, had, was, was over, he still, uh, he was, he was, uh, he served some time in, uh, in Uganda. Now, um, when we were growing up, until I recall until maybe I was uh, maybe five or six years old, we used to live in the official residence of the president at State House in Dar es Salaam. 
But um, after some time, my father decided that he should build his, his own house. So he took a loan, and he built this house which is outside uh, the capital city. And we lived there for most of the time. Now, he, he must have taken that loan uh, in the mid-60s. And until he retired in 1985, because he's, he had such uh, a small income from his salary, he had not managed to repay that loan. So he decided that uh, he would sell the house to the government so that he could repay that loan. But fortunately, uh, uh, the government uh, paid the balance of the loan and, 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 and handed uh, the house to him. So I, 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 I thought I should mention this, uh, this example because uh, to me, he's, he seemed to be a, a person who was who had uh, who was very honest. He could have been a very rich person. Me too. I could have been a very rich person. <laughs> <laughs> but I I don't regret it. I don't regret it. But I'm trying. To, I'm just trying to give you um, to to speak of these these examples from his life and from my life, so that you can know. What, uh, what type of person he was. Now, to, because he had such a, a, a small income, my mother had to really, my mother, my mother had to support the family. And he, um, he raised poultry. He had a poultry farm. And from the earnings that he, uh, she, sorry, she, she, she had a poultry farm. And from the earnings that she earned from that farm, we were, she, had, she was able to cover most of the, of the expenses for, 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 raising, for raising us as children. And we had to take turns also to, to, to work at that farm. It was not uh, like she had uh, employees who, who worked there. We had to work. Uh, every time we had some free time, we had to work at that farm to ensure that everybody who sat at the table had paid for his or her lunch. <laughs> Right. Uh, Selma mentioned uh, the leadership code that we had, uh, that was in the Arusha Declaration. Now, recently, when I was uh, preparing myself for this visit to, to London, I heard how that came about. I am uh, told that uh, during the early years after independence, some of, the, some of the people that uh, my father worked with, the politicians, began uh, to form their own companies, their own businesses. And every now and then, someone would come to, uh, come to him, uh, one, of, one of the ministers, and say, uh, this is my uh, business partner, and we have this company, and we want to do this and that, and, and they were asking for all kinds of favors. So he decided that uh, it was not possible for someone to hold public office and then also have these uh, business interests. And that is why that, uh, that leadership code was introduced uh, during the Arusha Declaration. Um, you'll have to excuse me, I'm not a very good speaker, so... You are, you are. I'll have, to, I'll, I'll, I'll have also to talk about his uh, total commitment to the unity of the African continent. One important aspect of the Arusha Declaration was its insistence that the Tanzanian government would work tirelessly towards the promotion of African unity. Mwalimu's commitment to African unity is very well known. I feel I, 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 like I, I have to repeat this, but he, it's, it's, very, it's very well known. Uh, he, he, he would tolerate a lot of criticism against what he believed in. But when you touched on African unity, he was, uh, he was just furious. And one example which, which exemplifies this, uh, this commitment to African unity was uh, there was a time after he retired when, 
when a group of parliamentarians in Tanzania decided that uh, Tanganyika, now Tanganyika is a part of, uh, of Tanzania, which formed the union together with Zanzibar. So this group, it's called, it was called G55, decided that uh, since Zanzibar has a government, and since we have a union government, and we don't have a, a Tanganyikan government, they thought uh, Tan Tanganyika deserved its own government. Now, let me read a bit here. Yes, Mwalimu Nyerere had a different opinion. He believed that once you begin to break up the union government by forming the Tanganyikan government, you would begin an irreversible process that would generate further divisive sentiments and create all types of interest groups demanding, a, de demanding attention to their own separate parochial interests. He believed that the most likely conclusion of such a move would be a weakening of the union and could eventually lead to a breakup of the union of Tanzania. So he went to the president, and at that time it was uh, President Mwinyi. And he told the president that I think uh, the fact that the prime minister has supported the move of these members of parliament and the fact that the secretary general of the party has also supported uh, that, uh, that move undermines the, the credibility of the government because the government was not elected on a mandate to form three governments. It was elected on a mandate to maintain the existing structure that was there, the union government and the Zanzibar government. So he, he, he was very forceful on that, I, 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 I am told. And he said uh, he believed that the only honorable thing that those two gentlemen should do is to resign. <laughs> but uh, now this I'm not sure about what happened after. But what, what I'm told is that the president was a bit reluctant to, to ask uh, his prime minister and the Secretary General of the, of the party to resign. So they agreed, they both agreed, that uh, Mwalimu Nyerere should go to these two people and tell them to resign. So he did that. But they refused, they refused, they didn't resign. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the next movie he made was he wrote a book in which he stated his position. And as soon as that book came out, they resigned. So. <laughs> <laughs> They resigned. So I, I'm just trying to say how, how passionate he was about African unity. And he, he, he made sure that everybody understood his, his position. Um, I have to mention, oh, maybe, maybe I should just mention that when he tried to publish that book in, in uh, Tanzania, no publisher would touch it. So he went to Zimbabwe and, and found a Zimbabwean publisher who published that book. Um, I also have to mention the fact that he's, he, you hear sometimes criticism in, in Tanzania, even now, that, uh, that he undermined other religions. This is, this is a total lie. I, I don't know where this comes from. It's a, it's a total lie because I know that he, well, he was a devout Catholic, but he had a great respect for other religions. And I have an example of, um, of something, of an incident which, which occurred at Butyama, at the village, where um, he, he received an, an appeal from the local Muslim cleric to help, uh, for some money, to, to help repair the mosque. The mosque. At, at Butiama. It was just a small mosque, a small building. Maybe, maybe a quarter of the, of the area we have here in this, in this hall. And my father was traveling to, to Libya at that time. So he told the cleric, listen, I'm, I'm on my way uh, to Libya. Just, uh, just wait until I come back and then you'll tell me, you'll tell me what, what the problem is and I'll try to see how I can, I can help. So when he went to Libya, 
he told uh, the Libyan leader, Tano Gaddafi, of the request that he had received from, uh, from, from the, uh, the Muslim cleric at Butiama. And, um, and Gaddafi was not only uh, very pleased to help, in fact, he wanted to build a whole new mosque. So <laughs> I'm told he was, uh, the, the flight out from Libya was delayed for a few hours because uh, Colonel Gaddafi was uh, busy trying to collect some money. In fact, it was cash, so that he could give it. <laughs> <laughs> so he could, he could hand the money to, to my father to take back to Butiama. And he did. And as soon as my father arrived at Butiama, he, he called the, the cleric. And he, he opened a briefcase, which I'm told had uh, more than 350,000 US dollars, <laughs> and gave it to the cleric. And now, and now at Butiama, I believe we have one of the largest mosques uh, in, that, in that area. <laughs> Uh, I, I have to talk also about, you know, uh, you, you, you frequently hear that uh, Mwalimu Nyerere was, was in power for, I believe, more than 25 years. And it, it would seem to many people that he enjoyed being there. But the, the fact is he, he tried to, to step down a long time ago. But there were certain events uh, in the country which prevented him from doing so. I believe that the first time he wanted to step down was in 1975, but he did not. And he says he did not because the country was experiencing uh, tremendous uh, economic problems, and he felt that uh, it was important that uh, he should hand over the country to someone when uh, the economy was doing well. So he stayed on until, uh, until 1985. In 1980, in 1980, he also wanted to step down. But uh, I think in, 19, yeah, in 1979, we had the war with, with Uganda. So the economy was still in, in, a, in a pretty bad shape. So he stayed on. But his, his belief about leadership was that uh, he felt that it was very important that leaders should not stay in power for a very long time. Because he says, uh, the longer you stay, the longer you lose touch with a growing generation of people who, are, who have different aspirations, have different needs. And so it's very important that uh, in, the, in, in, in leadership, you, you always have uh, a group of younger leaders who work together with the older leaders, and these older leaders have to give room to the younger people who are coming up. And that is based, really, that uh, philosophy is based on, uh, on, on something which is uh, within his tribe. We have a system of, uh, of hierarchies where uh, someone growing in the tribe has to go through certain stages. You're a child, then you, you become a young adult, then you have three stages of elders. And you have to move through those stages. You cannot uh, remain in one. You cannot say, uh, no, I, I, I wish I, I, I think I'd say I'll stay here. No, you have to. You have to go. You have to go. That's, that's, that's how he, he saw uh, leadership, even political leadership, in those, in those terms. Now, um, I would like to comment a bit on... Uh, on on a, on a comparison, because each time, each time um, uh, people talk about my father's policies, they make these comparisons. And unfortunately, I have to make the same comparisons to say, uh, which I do so reluctantly. Because uh, sometimes when you make comparisons, then you have to criticize uh, one side. Uh, and so I do this reluctantly, but I have to say it. Uh, you know, the current uh, policies that uh, are being followed, let's say, for example, by the Tanzanian government, these are neoliberal policies. Um, 
And these are followed by the government uh, as a result of more than two dec decades of changes that were adopted by the government in response to conditions set down by the international lending institutions and foreign governments that agreed to assist countries that were experiencing adverse economic conditions brought about by, among other factors, uh, drastic rises in the prices of oil and the prices and, and, and falling prices of uh, agricultural produce that uh, many of these countries depend on. So these countries were forced, this is what I believe, these countries were forced to follow these policies. And perhaps you can, you, you can have a debate to say uh, maybe they did not have a choice. Maybe they did not have a choice, maybe not. So that's debatable. But the reality is that there are differences between now and then. And perhaps one of the big differences is in the area of education. During the era, era of the Arusha Declaration, there was free education from primary school up to university. Up to university. And this meant that those without the means to pay for the education of their children were enabled to acquire the means by which they could transform their lives to, to a better life. Today it is increasingly difficult for the parents of poor children to afford to pay for their children's education. And this, is a, this may become a big problem in the future because I, I believe what will happen is that increasingly you'll have only those parents who can afford to pay for their children's education taking their children to school. And then you have a group of people, which, a larger group of people, who cannot afford to pay for their children's education. And even, even when they, they can pay for that education, they cannot get the best uh, possible education. And so you have, I believe you, you'll have a disconnect between those who stay at the top and a large group of people who, who remain at the bottom. And that's... Uh, that's a political time bomb. This is, this is how I feel. It's, it's a political time bomb. I don't know what's the solution. Maybe it's the Russia Declaration, but I don't know. It's <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very, maybe not. <laughs> now, uh, and let me comment a bit about, uh, about uh, some of the misinformation which, uh, which also a lot of mis misinformation about his policies. Uh, we have heard many times that people were forced to move into Ujamaa villages. I think Selma also touched on this. And it is true there were instances of people who were forcibly moved into these villages. But what appears to be implied is that forced villagization was part of his policies. This is not true, it was not. Maybe what happened really is uh, some of the government officials were maybe misinterpreted uh, what, what he intended. And I, I, can, I cannot understand why. You know, sometimes you feel uh, maybe it was deliberate because even in 1967, he already had this written down and Selma read part of this, but maybe I'll just uh, uh, return to this a bit. He wrote, it is important therefore to realize that the policy of Ujama Vijijini is not intended to be merely a revival of the old settlement schemes under another name. The Ujama village is a new conception based on the post Arusha declaration, you mentioned it, understanding that we need to develop that what we need to develop is people, not things, and that people can only develop themselves. Ujama villages are intended to be socialist organizations created by the people and governed by those who live and work in them. They cannot be created from outside, nor governed from outside. No one can be forced into an, an Ujama village, and no official at any level, 
can tell the members of an Ujama village what they should do together and what they should consider to do as individual farmers. An Ujama village is a voluntary association of people who decide of their own free will to live together and work together for their common good. That's just part of, uh, part of what he said. Uh, so I, 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 thought, I think it's important because there's a lot of misinformation about what Ujama really was. And these people take a few examples of, forced, of, of, of the events uh, where people are forced into these villages. And they try to create the impression that this was, this was how Ujama was implemented, or had to be implemented, which, was, which is not true. Now, um, let me mention a bit about his, about the socialism that, uh, that was contained in the Arusha Declaration. Because sometimes when you say socialism, there are so many types and kinds of socialism. So sometimes it's, in fact, uh, there's someone I met recently who said, maybe, maybe socialism is not the correct definition or the correct um, definition or the correct English word of what was happening, although it's close to it, but maybe it's not the, quite the correct definition. Uh, many of those who opposed him will not tell you that his policies provided space even for capitalism. Now, just imagine that. Imagine uh, <laughs> that, in that in that system, in that economic system, even capitalism had, had its role, had a role to play. And I'll, I'll read from, from one of his uh, uh, writings. We have not excluded private enterprise. And we want people to start their own productive and commercial undertaking, uh, undertakings. But we have said that the emphasis in our economy should be on ownership by the people through the people's own institutions. What we are thus trying to build is a mixed economy. Economy which includes both public and private enterprise, with an emphasis on the former, so as to get the most beneficial economic development. I think this, is, this was very important to, to mention. And uh, I'd, look, I, I, I'd also like to add here that uh, after I completed my, my education, uh, which is much later, um, after the Arusha Declaration was, was launched. I was, and I remain a person who, who, whose, whose activities uh, can be considered to be capitalist. That's a big statement to make. But, uh, <laughs> but I, uh, I'll explain, I'll explain. And, until 1999, um, um, when my father died, I had a small company in, in Dar es Salaam. And after he died, I, I closed that company and I moved to the village in Butiama. And um, even now I have a small uh, construction company. And, I, and when I say small, I mean really small. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I'm sometimes the manager, the construction supervisor, the purchasing officer. So I, I, I do a lot of things myself. But the point I want to make is that I do not see inconsistencies that within Tanzania's Ujama, there were individuals um, in private enterprise. I don't see that inc inconsistency. Because I, I believe what is important is that, is that in the declaration, it is stated that it, it is absolute, uh, just a moment. Sorry, I, I misread that. Let me start again. What is important in that declaration is that it stated the absolute preeminence of the dignity, welfare, and freedom of the individual in the country's development program. I believe that in order to guarantee the minimum chance of a dignified life to those who are not self-employed, the government has an important role to play to ensure that the disadvantaged uh, groups in society enjoy those benefits. Thank you very much.